Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Anthony P. Consciousness Hour. This is the first show of 2017, and I'm really looking forward to what could be a very, very interesting year in many, many ways. We've got some quite interesting guests, quite interesting guests planned. This particular show I was very keen to do because around about two months ago, uh, Paul Eno and Ben Eno interviewed me on their own uh, podcast and I was absolutely fascinated by their viewpoint and their worldview because of the great deal of synergy between what I would consider the real leading edge empirical research in terms of para paranormal psychology and paranormal experiences, because these guys are actually doing, they're out in the field and have some incredible stories to tell. Uh, I then took the opportunity to read their book, um, Turning Home God, Ghosts and Human Destiny, well, Paul's book, and it blew me away. I, I found it absolutely intriguing, a fantastic read, and I know they've got a new book out as well, which I haven't had the opportunity to read, but I will be doing so in the future, and I'm hoping we talk upon that. Um, but without further ado, what I'd like you to do, guys, is just to tell your, tell the, the, the watchers, the listeners, I never know quite how we term them on this program, um, as to a little bit about your background and a little bit about why it is that you became both interested in the phenomena you're interested in, uh, and tell us a little bit about the work you do. So please fire away. For beauty, I, see, I, I, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, what can one say to that? Uh, well, actually, Anthony, um, you might trace my origins in the paranormal, so to speak, paranormal interest, back to the age of seven, when, and you, as you can imagine, this has always been very difficult for me to talk about, but uh, at the age of seven, I was witness to my father's suicide. And at the time, mm -hmm. we had a mixed religion uh, situation in the family, but at the time, uh, I was in a strict Roman Catholic school where if you ate a hot dog on Friday or committed suicide, you would go straight to hell. However, um, I happened to be in a school with the Sisters of Mercy. I, some of them, the name might apply to, I suppose. And they, um, I had one of the saints as opposed to one of the potential axe murderers in that order, and she got me through this more or less by saying, that God is bigger than all that. And that really got me through. A number of years later, when I was the age of 14, I entered the seminary when you could still do that at that age. Probably not a good idea. However, uh, I began to wonder about purgatory. I said, maybe, where, where is my father? Maybe the ghosts that we uh, hear about throughout history and in every culture, everywhere in the world, are souls in purgatory. That's how I started out. So my first case... 1970 to 1972, I was in an abandoned village uh, in um, northeast Connecticut, and I was uh, just blown away by uh, everything that occurred because nothing corresponded uh, w w with even the old 19th century ideas about what ghosts are, never mind purgatory. These people didn't seem to be dead at all, never mind anything else. So I began to wonder about time and space and things of this kind that led to the goofy ideas I have today. So that's how I got started. Uh, well, how I got started was essentially being the spawn of this man to my right. And from the age of six, I had sat through every single one of his presentations. So I could probably recite word for word. There was the old slide projectors that we used to have. Yeah, there'll be a test after the show. Yes, yes, there will be. Oh, I and I will class with flying colors because I memorize every single word. So I sort of was indoctrinated with this idea of the multiverse and quantum physics being behind all paranormal phenomena, and it was more seeing it in practice in daily life rather than just learning about it. Be like, oh, that's a great idea. It was more like, well, this is just how life is, son. That's my impression of you, by the way. And moving from that, it be became sort of a, an internalized portion of my life, being aware of other worlds and how things work, and even getting um, training from a full-blooded Aztec shaman. That was a grand old time. And having my own spiritual journey along the way that took me through all sorts of interesting points of view and culminating into the human being I am today. And if I may add, I, I think that Ben, as it turned out, operates on, on rather a different level than I do. And I think it, what we together, with our approaches and methods, is complementary. Uh, if I, you know, either, either that or I'm a self-satisfied idiot. But I, I don't I think consider that, that a compliment. Okay. <laughs> but in any case, we, uh, we're quite the, uh, quite the team, I, I tend to think, <laughs> I mean, at least uh, from my point of view. So. 
Do you know what I think would be the most wonderful thing in the world would be to have a close relative, a father, a mother, a, a, a sister or a brother or, or a wife or a spouse or whatever, that would share your interests the way the two of you do? Because I think that must be absolutely wonderful to, you know, have a similar worldview and be going out there as father and son and doing some incredible things. And I think that, that is a fantastic circumstance to be in. Now, I'd like to go back way back to the, the, the incident at Barahak, because that really, really fascinated me, the way in which you go to this, this famed location, I guess in Massachusetts, I'm not sure where, but somewhere in New England, where there is this old village that was inhabited by Welsh immigrants to America. And I think this was what changed your whole attitude towards ghostly phenomenon. So maybe, maybe Paul, if you can just explain a little bit about what happened at Barahak and why it was it changed your idea of exactly what ghosts are and what they could be. Uh, sure, Anthony. Uh, actually, that was the very case I referred to in the introduction mm -hmm. there in northeast Connecticut. And uh, the place had been inhabited uh, probably no more recently than uh, 60 to 80 years before we were there in 1971 and 1972. And uh, just uh, briefly, I had read about this in the newspaper. I wanted to test this purgatory theory and uh, the Hartford, Connecticut newspaper, and uh, had pointed out a local historian, uh, Harry Chase. Now, this is the sort of man no town should be without, it's sort of an old guy who lives in the house he was born in, in the woods, and knows everything everyone did for the past uh, several centuries. Uh, every relationship, they're very interesting. So he knew all about this uh, this vill lost village, as it was called. It was also called the Village of Voices. And we find he took us to uh, five other seminary, five seminary students, including myself. Uh, on the second expedition, we had a photo expert with us from a corporate entity in Hartford. And uh, as soon as we walked into the place, it was a very hot August day, in 1971, and you could hear things, uh, except none of it was normal. There were no birds. You could hear farm implements banging together. At least that's what it sounded like, you had metal, people talking, cows mooing, dogs barking, uh, people talking. It, it was very odd, and yet it, it felt not scary, but almost depressing. And uh, you would walk about a quarter of a mile into... The, um, the place where the cellar holes were, that this had been people, uh, where, where several people had lived. And then up on the hill was a little cemetery where most of them had been buried. Things, odd things happened really throughout the visit. Uh, we began to take photographs. And, of course, this is long before digital photography. You had to wait until you went to a lab and had the things developed. You couldn't see them right away. Unless you had a Polaroid camera, which wasn't really there. Um, and uh, we... We got photographs of things we later saw, uh, for example, that very night. Uh, there, there's a rather uh, well-known photograph of, uh, called The Baby in the Tree. And you can actually see what looks like a reclining figure, almost a Renaissance carving, like a cherub or something, uh, lying in the, the branch of a tree. And it's quite clear. And uh, the photo lab later on said this is an anomaly. That's the term they would use. I guess they still use that term. But you had negatives you could look at, and they could tell us something more or less was a reflection. You can't say something is definitely a ghost, quote, unquote, or whatever. So th these were all the things that happened. Among the more dramatic phenomena, uh, on the first trip, uh, we were down by the cellar hole area below the cemetery. Again, this is all overgrown uh, woods uh, at this point. And we began to hear the laughter of children. And this came from down the hill uh, by Nightingale Brook. Uh, where these people had had a, a mill where they had made spinning wheels. And there's really no remnant of that, but the brook is still there, obviously. So we, we kind of walked toward there, and, and you could hear the children, but they were, they were the, the laughter was moving very rapidly and unnaturally up and down this brook, as if they were in a car traveling at about 60 miles an hour. Uh, but there was no road. I mean, this was a very, very sparsely inhabited area, the nearest... Uh, dwelling was a 4-H club camp about a half mile away, so that uh, didn't uh, get us anywhere, but we could hear these children. One thing I never wrote <clears throat> until the, the book that just came out in November was that I was able to pick out, I knew some of those children. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I knew some of them. When we would hear people talking, 
when we hear, for example, an ox cart going by, uh, and it, it was invisible, but we, could, we all heard it, hoof beats, wooden wheels, a team driver yelling, and, and the crack of a whip. I knew who that was. And it re- that was probably the most frightening thing. It wasn't the experiences of these sounds and sights. It was uh, mostly sound. Uh, it was the idea that I knew some of these people. And I said, I'm just being I shouldn't do this anymore, that kind of thing. And I was afraid to write about that. I was in enough trouble in the seminary for doing this in the first place. Never mind uh, if, if I hinted at anything psychic or mediumistic, I would have been out the door sooner than I was. As, as it was in 77, they threw me out anyway, uh, about a year and a half before ordination. So I write about that in Behind the Paranormal, Everything You Know is Wrong, the one that just came out, uh, in, in full. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, other people uh, would look at me and say, are you okay? The other, the other fellows who were with me. Uh, one of the other really strange things was uh, we, we, the photo expert we brought with us in, in late 71 uh, was a, um, uh, an employee of uh, United Technologies Corporation in East Hartford, very uh, feet-on-the-ground fellow, and we brought him specifically because he did not believe a word of this. And he's the one to whom all the weirdest things happen. For example, it was nighttime, and we had made it the point to map this area very thoroughly on our uh, first two trips, and we had uh, we knew where everything was, and uh, we could have walked around the area at night even without spotlights. That's an example. We knew the place well. Uh, Marcel, it was, this was the fellow uh, I'm referring to, uh, and uh, two of us, <clears throat> three of us were walking up toward the cemetery. It was nighttime. We wanted to see what we could see, and we had seen quite a bit there on the previous trip, including streaks moving through the trees, faces suspended in the air, and this sort of thing. Now, down by the cellar holes, two other fellows were there with a, with a, uh, a state-of-the-art uh, cassette tape recorder from those days, uh, trying to record the voices should they occur again. So we were moving up toward the cemetery, very, very dark, and all of a sudden, uh, Marcel stopped, and he had a walking stick, and he kind of leaned over on his walking stick, and he was huffing and puffing. And I said, oh, no, he's going to have a heart attack, and this is long before cell phones or anything. We were cut off from the world. But he said, no, no, he felt fine. All of a sudden, he started to sob and leaned over on his walking stick. Now, again, you have, you have to have known this man, a very, very feet on the ground, hardly ever practiced, a very serious man. It's, I don't know how he ever fell in love and got married, but he did. So we, he said he could not physically move forward or to the left, which would have been the cemetery. Now, now we could not find the cemetery. Spotlights, it, was, it wasn't even there. However, he could move freely back and to the right, in the direction away from the cemetery. The three of us pulled him physically. He could move <clears throat> back and, and to the right, but he could not move to his left or forward. He was rooted to the spot. We couldn't pull him off that spot. So he said he felt as if he was... Something was, uh, well, he used the word possessed. I don't think that, because I've seen that, but I don't think that's what this was. But um, all, that's when we heard the voices. Uh, off to our left, perhaps 10, 20 feet, very close, we heard the muttering of male voices. And you know how you can sometimes hear a group of people talking. You know it's in English, but you really can't make out what they're saying. That's what this was like. And so... In ensuing, so we decided that retreat was the better part of valor, and so we, we pulled back and didn't even try to go to the cemetery. The next day we went there in the daylight, and there it was. So, if, if, if what we think we know now, I suspect that perhaps uh, this is a, well, the Native Americans would call it a thin place. Um, shamans might say the same thing. A physicist might say, well, who believes in the, 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 the tilt that we take on quantum uh, mechanics, particularly the multiple worlds interpretation, that perhaps they, these were intersect points. And we find that in the paranormal, to get a little general, that uh, these things don't just happen to, to people. People participate in whatever the, the phenomenon may be. And we think that perhaps, uh, so uh, if, if we're correct, and these are a sharing of realities uh, at, at intersect points, that perhaps uh, we were partially in uh, a parallel reality that is actually still 1780 or so when that cemetery was, was put there. And uh, we were attending even, who knows, maybe the first funeral. Maybe the place got its reputation for being haunted partially because people from the past were seeing us. And I mean, these were all things that 
So uh, whatever was happening, uh, the voices we heard sounded frightened, and we we often run into that. We find that ghosts often think that we're ghosts haunting them. They see us or hear us as we see or hear them. Why? Because we're looking through what probably are the electromagnetic brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, or membranes, as a physicist, a believer in this might say. Uh, so I think that might, might be what was happening all through uh, this uh, Barahak case, Barahak being the name of the village, as told to us by this historian, or the Welsh for breaking of the bread, a ra- rather personable name. But um, the experience of, I think everything we experienced there, including my knowing who people were or are, um, was the creepiest thing and may be explainable by what, what, through what I've, just, uh, what I've just said. I later found out, many years later, two things. One was that that baby-like figure we saw in the tree was a well-known phenomenon there uh, from the past. Uh, a book of local history said that people had seen go to that cemetery at night because they would see, quote, ghosts reclining in the branches of a certain elm tree, unquote. So <laughs> we saw the same thing almost 200 years later, apparently, and, and also photographed it. And then the phenomenon of, of me knowing these people, I found out uh, the second thing was that, that Ben and I are closely related to these people. They were cousins of ours, Randall family. And, I, and here, here again, the bond between people of, of blood relations, they were rather close, like third or fourth cousins, which going back in history isn't that far away from each other, really. So, um, again, I think that um, taking the uh, quantum theory uh, or the MWI to its illogical conclusion, uh, I perhaps am, I'm not going to use the term, there really is no past, no future, it's, it seems to be all simultaneous, but, uh, I really am um, John Randall. Jonathan Randall, uh, driving that that uh, ox cart through the woods at some point in the multiverse, where it's still, uh, where he would be 1810 or so, uh, and then his son, and it, I, I knew these children, some of them anyway, and I could pick out, aha, Porter, uh, Lambsden, a few others, another Randall, Higginbottom, there's, there's your uh, Welsh name. <clears throat> and I think perhaps because... Um, the identity, there was a connection there between where I'm me here and where I'm them there. And uh, we've seen that in some, some very dramatic circumstances. So that's, that's the story of Better Hats, my point of view. It's interesting here, isn't it, that many, many years ago there was the stone tape theory of um, hauntings, you know, the idea that somehow emotion, you know, it reminds me very much of the, the, the organ energy ideas of Wilhelm Weick and people like that, that energy can dissipate and can go into stone and the certain circumstances can come out again. But of course, that's a recording and a recording is like anything else. It's, it's, it's inanimate. But here you had a, a kind of a, a tangible relationship with the phenomena in that you recognize the individuals or you sensed you knew them. And I was going to be intrigued as to, to what you were going to take that, you know, as if it's some form of DNA memory that evokes these kind of things. Um, just just pulling, pulling Ben in here, I mean, you, what's your opinion of, of your father's experiences? Because you've heard that story many, many times. And from your point of view as a young person, do you have a similar take on it to, to what Paul has? Well, unfortunately, being the man of the son, my, or being the son of this man, I should say, uh, I, I do share a lot of the similar opinions, but I think we should add that we did attempt to go back there <clears throat> in the last couple of years. We we, we were teaching a class um, this at this this institute. What was it called? I forget. Uh, the Learning Connection in Providence, Rhode Island. Learning yeah. Connection, yeah. There was a bunch of different seminars and stuff when we were teaching a class on, um, I think it was interacting with the multiverse or something like that. And we uh, were like, oh, well, let's take a class field trip to Barahack, I guess. And um, so we packed ourselves up, and we all went over there. We started walking through. It was really, it was a very strange, strange place because you couldn't hear any birds. And it's, it was like, I don't know, like late March, early April. It was like just around the time spring was starting. So, I mean, you should hear something, like crickets, whatever, nothing, completely silent. It was really weird, but we were like halfway to the site 
when a uh, I think it was a jeep pulled up behind us, and it was people who owned the land, and they're like, "You guys." Well, people related to the woman who owns the land, whom I know well. Yes, and they uh, <laughs> kicked us off. <laughs> Well, there's, you know, I don't, because I, I sort of get the blame in the town for uh, writing about this in, in 1998 in the, the book Faces at the Window, and uh, and I don't blame them. I mean, I had no idea it was going to capture the imagination of people all over the world and that people are going to try and go there and make nuisances of themselves, which I tell them not to do in the book. Um, but, uh, you know, all, all was well, but, they, you know, we made peace, but they still didn't let us go in there. I would be interested, if I may... I would be interested in Ben, uh, who has a degree in audio engineering, what his take on this uh, rock recording thing is. I mean, I don't think that's that's possible. <laughs> I don't I don't know I don't know of any sort of mechanism that that would do that. There was an idea. What was it like phosphorus? Um, well, ferrous oxide. Ferrous oxide. And, uh, that's a fantastic amount to even to begin thinking about audio. I mean, you'd have to have like a vent, like right there. That just wouldn't. That just wouldn't yeah, make just, any sense. Well, the problem with audio is, it's still a physical experience because essentially how we create sound is by disturbing air molecules, which is called amplitude modulation. So the way that we talk, our vocal cords disturb the air molecules around us to create sound. Whether we vibrate our vocal cords at a certain rate. Usually, as humans, we vibrate our vocal cords between 1,000 kilohertz and 5,000 kilohertz, around there, around that general vicinity. But over time, our voices change, our ears change. So, like, the way we hear things, there's all these tiny little hairs that pick up little sounds in our ears. So when you're a baby, you can hear a perfect spectrum of 20 uh, cycles per second or 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz perfectly, which is why babies have such sensitive ears. So... Over time, those hearing cells or those little hairs in your in your like ear holes die, so you can't pick up sound anymore. So the thing is, it's still a physical experience. So you need something to disturb the air molecules to be able to hear something. So you need something physical to be there. So the question is, can a rock disturb air molecules? No, not that we know of. It would have to have like um, some sort of really powerful driver or something underneath it or some way for it to shake incredibly fast for it to create air to create that sort of disturbance it needs for things to be audible or even producing an image it would need to move extremely fast i mean it's not like there's like a roll of film in there or like some sort of digital apparatus like a rock would have the the only thing i don't i don't think it's i don't think it's possible through anything you know now I think it's, I think it's, it might be possible through some, ex, some sort of like extra sensory and, and extra sensory way. But even then, with, through the multiverse, I'm still, I'm still racking my brain about how something like, uh, like an EVP is picked up, unless you're literally hanging in between the world itself. Well, that's just approaching it from the other end. My question: uh, would, would the children laugh, and, and would, especially with the ox cotton? You know, if if these are ghosts, spirits in the classical sense, sense, uh, that means they have no bodies, which means no vocal cords, which means no vibration. I mean, how how does the physical phenomenon occur? Uh, so the old ideas, right there in Pomfret and Barahak, I realized these ideas are not good enough. The old mm-hmm. ideas of spirits have been dead. Um, and then later in that decade, I started running into ghosts of people who are not dead and people seeing ghosts of themselves and buildings coming and that, that sort of thing. And it expanded the idea. Um, and, but I, but that, the same thing occurred to me uh, that Ben just stated, you know, record you know, residual hauntings. Okay, we're, we're, and I was an early advocate of that theory until I started to think about it. Uh, but recorded on what? Uh, certainly not the rocks. The trees were all different. The soil is different. Mm-hmm. Everything is different. Again, unless there's some quantum explanation. Uh, but I, admit, I think we admit the possibility of somehow or through undiscovered science, but uh, yeah. until that occurs, it just doesn't seem to make any sense to me about residual. Not with modern physics. Yeah. yeah. So the only alternative I can, that I can think of is that you're dealing with the real people actually in, in that time who are perhaps experiencing you just as you're experiencing them, you know, through a multiversal intercept. I think this is what makes me very, very excited about coming across your work, because, you know, I write about quantum physics. I write about the interface between quantum physics and consciousness. 
and the idea of microtubules and everything else. And I think an application of the Everett's Many Worlds interpretation is as good an explanation, and that's why it was really interesting to hear Ben say that, you know, if you apply our knowledge of acoustics to this theory, it simply doesn't stand up. It doesn't work. But clearly there is some form of perception taking place by by a human mind perceiving something. But effectively, did, it, did the sound the sounds registered on a recording device though? So you were you you were able to record the sounds? Did that happen? No, we were not. That's the ironic thing with, with the laughing of the with the laughing. I thought it very interesting. EVPs in reverse almost. We stood mm. there and we all heard it very very clearly. Again, moving up and down. This is the laughter, and it would not record now. Uh, Again, you have to realize, of course, that this is 1970s technology, really 1960s technology. Real to real recorders. Yeah, well, it wasn't real to real, all the cassette recorder, which is really the same thing, uh, on magnetic tape, and, uh, you know, that's, that's all we had. Uh, we attempted to um, record it at a future point, but we didn't hear it again. Uh, interestingly, I suppose, in, in defense, perhaps, of some sense of the residual theory, uh, other people have reported the children and other people have reported the ox cart driver. Okay. The question with that is, are there spirits of wooden wheels and, and animals and all this other bit, yeah. the metal implements we heard hanging together and that? Again, I didn't think it was good enough. However, uh, other people have heard it in the same time and place, aha, uh-huh, perhaps residual. But I don't believe that either, really, because I have, I'm thinking of one case in New Hampshire where I actually changed something that had been long uh spoken about by experiences, um, a sound uh, that had occurred in a house that was always the same, uh, usually at similar times of day, this sort of thing, and uh, I managed to change it by interacting with it. As a matter of fact, I've actually managed to shut off some of these things from time to time, uh, presumably by doing something, I'm not sure what, to, clo- to, to uh, close the intersect point, if that's what it is. And uh, so, I, you know, again, I don't think the residual theory is any better than the 19th century spiritualist theories. I think in many ways, I think you're hitting the nail on the head here, and it was one of the problems I've always had with hauntings, is the fact, you know, that spirits, if they are animated spirits that have their own worldview, that they're, that they're, they're kind of entities in some way, as to how they were clothing, are, are, as you said, are the, the wagon wheels, it's the ghost of a wagon wheel, is it, is it the ghost of um, a tutu? Is it the ghost of a pair of trousers? Now, self-evidently, this doesn't make any sense because, you know, you can't, it doesn't work that way. So we then have to come back to the idea that there is some form of intersection taking place, as you rightly say, between alternate universes or whatever we like to call it. And this is what we're actually perceiving. So these individuals are going about their everyday business in a normal way, and you are the inter, inter, the person that's pushing yourself into their world. And, you know, as if there are these kind of point locations around the world where the, the, the lines between the realities are so thin that they break through under certain, under certain conditions or where people are sensitive to them. Now, I'm very much taken, for instance, in your book, the case of the young girl who was having a reoccurring dream about a location and was then discovered to be the haunting in that location. So maybe you can explain that one, and maybe we can have a, th- a three-way discussion about exactly what's taking place there, because this seems that this girl was having lucid dreams of a location in Connecticut, where there was a house that she was haunted. But maybe you could explain a little bit more about that one. Uh, sure, Anthony. Uh, that was uh, a real landmark in my experience, because by the end of the 1970s, I was thoroughly confused is none, none of this made any sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, at, at the end of uh, 79, well, yeah, the fall of 79, uh, I was just out of graduate school and had nothing and was uh, living in a little cottage by a lake in Connecticut. And uh, the phone rang. I, I'd been on television uh, recently about uh, some of these things, uh, my first appearance <clears throat> in New Haven. And uh, the phone rang one day, and it was a young girl from the University of Connecticut, and not too far away from where I was. And she said that she, uh, would, as, as the very words she used were, to, I, I'll, if I live to be 100, I'll, I'll never uh, get over this. Right? You know, and she, her voice was shaking. She said that uh, she and her friends, uh, several friends, and her younger sister, who was well was a, one, uh, interested in the paranormal and the occult, uh, they <clears throat> excuse me, had been in uh, Maine, southern Maine, 
for the previous weekend. And uh, the town, I later found out, was York Harbor, lovely town. And uh, they had been driving, uh, they were in the back country, driving around the corner, and there was a, a very ordinary-looking house. And the, the young sister said, stop the car, that's my house. And so uh, before they could stop her, she got, got out and ran up for the porch, and they thought, well, she's really gone this time, but they followed her. And before they got to the porch, uh, she had been knocking on the door, and, and the woman answered the door, took one look at this girl, and screamed. Uh, a man came running. He was. Uh, this turned out to be a middle-aged couple in, in, uh, in their 40s with no children. And he saw her and couldn't speak. Uh, everyone was uh, creeped out, as they say, by this time, and... Uh, the man finally said, uh, or I should say the girl finally said, I apologize for intruding, but I feel as though I know this house. The man looked at her. He was shaking, and he said, you should know this house. You haunt it. So that was about all anybody could take. So, so down they go from the steps. They apologized, you know, bowed or whatever. And uh, But they did catch a name on the mailbox when they were leaving. And as luck would have it, my mother's family had had a, a – um, summer home in this town. It's an oceanside village uh, in this town for over a hundred years. My, my great grand uncle built it in 1875. So I knew people in the town. I'd spent many summers there. So I uh, did, made some inquiries, found out the phone number of these people, and uh, I wrote to them. And I didn't dare call them. I didn't keel over for sure. So I uh, explained uh, who I was, every clergy, psychi- psychologist I'd ever worked with in this field, just to give myself some credibility. Well, two days later, he, uh, three days later, he called, and he said, uh, we have to talk to someone. And the story as I got it was this. This young girl had had dreams of being in this house doing certain things, walking down the stairs, looking out the front window, doing this or that. And the people, when I interviewed them, told me they had seen her in transparent exactly the same things, walking down the stairs, looking out the window, et cetera, et cetera. They had uh, become so frightened of being in their own house that they would not be alone in the house together. Every room, that they were together because they were frightened. Um, what is very interesting about this, and I was dazzled by the circumstances, so that I didn't put much attention on this at the time, was uh, that uh, the, the, the sightings of the girl were not the, at the same times when she was dreaming, which I, from this point I, I find very interesting. Now, uh, looking at it from the, now, I sent her immediately to Hartford for the uh, the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which uh, still used a form of it, and, and will determine if you need any further treatment uh, psych- from a psychiatric standpoint. And she didn't. Uh, a little fluky, like all of us, but not nothing to be treated. Uh, the people, on the other hand. Uh, it said that uh, as soon as they met on that porch, all phenomena had ceased immediately. And a physicist might say that in some ways perhaps the wave function was collapsed, and the two worlds had become one. And, uh, and I later spoke with shamans. As a matter of fact, um, uh, that very year, uh, shortly after this case, I spoke. I was in Australia, and I spoke with uh, for seven hours. I bought them a lot of sodas, uh, a little... Uh, Australian Aborigine named um, uh, Minda Louie, and he said, um, and I was honored because they don't usually talk to outsiders, and he said effectively, in so many words, you're on the right track with this multiverse thing, so that's what we do. If somebody has, like, cancer here, we go into a world where they don't have it, we, he didn't use the term collapse the wave fight, we bring the worlds together, make it real, and he doesn't have cancer anymore. He said, sometimes it's not all that simple, but he said, that's effectively what we do. So I mean, that was a revelation that kind of brought it together for me. So um, in any case, uh, these people in uh, Maine and never had the experience again. The girl in Connecticut uh, was, uh, uh, kept in touch with them for quite a while, and uh, she never had the, another experience like that. But again, the, the ghost of someone who wasn't dead. And again, uh, further confusing me, uh, so that the old ideas, just even a theological, a spiritualist, they just didn't make any sense. Well, of course, it's intriguing here, isn't it? Because she... She was somehow dreaming herself into a location that wasn't known to her and manifesting within that location. I, I have understood that correctly, haven't I? This was a location she did not know. It was a house she did not know. Okay. Well, so why do you... Well, what? Here's, what I'll go on. Here's the, 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 what I would say today. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was, was that the first thought that popped into the girl's mind when she saw the house was, why aren't there any toys in the yard? 
because in the dream, she was the mother of two children, and it was her house, and she remembered that. So uh, I think what we may have here is, is several people experiencing the same parallel worlds, okay? Uh, and as and the, the, probably the, the most bizarre thing in quantum uh, theory, if you believe it this way, is that um, all possibilities really do exist somewhere or some way. Um, if, if, uh, if Ben were to take the computer, not only would we make a pig's breakfast out of this show, we would have to replace the computer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but we would create another world in which uh, we had done that. But the world in which we are now would continue normally, uh, and, and we would continue as, as we are, uh, which, of course, um, ruins the whole time paradox uh, theory that Hollywood likes to tie into. If you go back in time and shoot your own mm -hmm. grandfather, how can you be born? But well, you've created another world. The one in which you uh, were, were born will continue normally. Um, so, again, I think it, because it's far more complex than that, apparently, but I think that um, this case in Maine was uh, an illustration that we're living in a number, maybe a number of different, uh, if you want to say, for lack of a better term, incarnations or worlds at the same time, and they all seem to be simultaneous. Uh, again, uh, <clears throat> past and future really being functions of our consciousness, and uh, uh, it kind of rewrites the whole theory of what paranormal phenomena may be. Well, funnily enough, um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Labyrinth of Time, and in the Labyrinth of Time, I had a whole section. I think we're getting feedback. I'm hearing my own voice on your speaker. Uh, okay. I, I don't know why that is. Turn on the volume. Okay. Uh, turn on the volume. I mostly went the volume on the laptop, but that works too. Okay. So, yeah. There just seemed to be a delay, which was which was quite problematical. It's still slightly there, but um, but. Well, very really much the reality at this point. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Across the brain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, it could be. But the whole idea of that, that my act of observation collapses the wave function, in which case my viewpoint of the universe is subtly different from yours because I might be collapsing a different wave function. And, of course, as we know, the Everett's Many Worlds interpretation is very much an application of the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. And therefore, the idea that we all carry within us our own version of, of reality in some way, which which then intrigues me because your cases are very much proving this. The idea, you know, that that's what I'm so excited about your work, because I've been writing about this as a theoretician for many, many years. But what I haven't come across is actual examples of people who are doing research like you guys are applying quantum physics to these circumstances and saying it's far more complex than we can imagine. I mean, for instance, you touch upon it in your book, and it's something I write about, the idea that we're all one single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively, as Bill Hicks said. So the idea is that, you know, in some way we can attune into other people's mini-universes in such a way like this young woman was in terms of existing within the same environments in one way or another. Now, from this, it spins off to the events that took place in Ottawa in 1978 that you describe. Now, the story of the two children in the, in the basement of the house, which you can explain to the listeners in a second, because this reminded me of, there's a very, very famous case, uh, well, very, very famous in the UK, of the green children in, in a village in Suffolk where these children had just appeared from nowhere um, and they had a green tinge to them and they were totally confused and I think in the end they either died or they went back, I'm not quite sure. But clearly it does seem that sometimes there are these, we have glimpses of these alternate worlds and I know in this basement in Ottawa it seemed that people had witnessed, a child had witnessed initially these children and then subsequently the family saw them. So if you can explain a little bit about that one and then we can start moving on to the really the latest material you're doing. So if you can just tell us a little bit about that one, and let's move on to the later work. Sure. Um, the Ottawa case was in 1979, and I traveled a great deal that year, and a, uh, an associate of mine was a Canadian uh, Army officer and had um, uh, relatives who lived in a new subdivision, uh, housing subdivision outside Ottawa. And they said that they were very frightened about something that had uh, happened to their son, uh, who was 10 years old, and then that they later saw themselves. 
I went to interview them, and that little boy wasn't home at the time. He was in school. But the, the story essentially was that the little boy had come up from the, 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 the cellar from the one day, and they just a brand-new house, and said uh, they're, they're, the two children are under the stairs, and they look scared. And the parents said, yeah, right, you know. But this happened uh, several times. Again, finally they went downstairs, and they saw themselves, a boy and a girl, in what appeared to be almost jumpsuits uh, underneath the, the, the stairs down into the, uh, into the cellar. Uh, they, at first, the children seemed not to be able to see them. And at first, uh, but then as time went by, yeah, I'm talking about a few minutes, uh, they did seem to see uh, the people uh, in, from who owned the house, and they would begin to shout, but they couldn't be heard. There was, there was no audio, as it were. Uh, they um, appeared to be almost in a uh, sort of a shimmery uh, kind of uh, manifestation or whatever it was. And so the natural conclusion, well, <clears throat> these must be ghosts, uh, somebody who lived it. But, you know, again, I, I just don't think that held up. Uh, again, why the clothes? Why, why the, um, I'm not going to say alien, but, but the unusual clothes. And they were both identically clothed. So that's uh, <clears throat> after they, the uh, three members of the family experienced this, it never happened again. And again, a rather simple case, perhaps a, what we might call a pass-through. But uh, again, the, the little boy, I later talked to him, and he said that uh, they looked as though they were trying to communicate, but he couldn't hear them. Um, and they seemed very frightened. They were hugging each other, these two children, you know, sitting like squatting on the ground around the floor. And uh, that, that's pretty much all there is to it. But again, uh, Certain points stand out. Why couldn't they be heard? Uh, they seen but not heard. And uh, whereas in other many cases of our own, things can be heard but not seen. Uh, why were they identically dressed as they were? Uh, where or when were they from? Um, were, had they even lived in, in, in our uh, world family at all? You know, or perhaps uh, they were from somewhere or somewhere else. But uh, uh, again, a case about which much was not answered because it simply stopped. Because these are the things that really intrigue me. It's the it's it's always the the kind of the unusual cases, the the ones that really seem to point in a certain direction. Now, in terms of your latest work and the work the two of you are working on together and the material in your new book, would you like to share with um, with the listeners or the watchers something about your latest work and where you where you now are and where you're going with your work? Because as I say, I'm I'm delighted to discover that there are researchers taking very, very similar viewpoints to myself. I mean, for instance, I was very intrigued in your book, the way you're talking about the idea of, of, of parasitical entities that, that seem to have their own motivations out there, that, that can actually come through into this dimension. And that, that there is something far more elaborate and far more interesting taking place. And I'm very keen to know where you are now, both of you, and where you're taking your research, and any other real cases that you think really reinforce your position on this that you have discovered in recent years together. So fire away, because I'm really keen to know. All right, well. Oh, God, which ones? <laughs> well, we, uh, well, Ben, ben Lang in 05. OK, uh, after long discussions with uh, his mom about whether the, he should. But he, he's he's a natural. I mean, I haven't by my side any time. And uh, <clears throat> now I don't I feel naked if he's not with me. Maybe I, I don't know what, whatever. But uh, we've been working on um, what can I suppose only be called flap areas, paranormal flap areas. And uh, this began when a woman who had read the book uh, Footsteps in the Attic uh, got in touch with us in 05. And she was in uh, the town of Torrington, Connecticut, in Litchfield County. And she said that the only thing that could explain all, all the, the, the preposterous things that were happening in her house was this idea of the, of the many worlds coming together at certain points. Uh, for example, they, they would sit in their living room and see legs hanging from the ceiling, walking as though on a surface that was not present in our world. Her friend, whole family would see this. And this had been going on for over 60 years. The same family had lived in this house uh, really since the early 1800s, six generations. And so we, we went out there and, um, we walked in in August of, of 70, of, um, uh, 05. And then you could feel people walking around to the, the place was alive with all sorts of things going on that did not seem related to one another. And I had, I had long since learned, you don't just look at one house. You don't just look at one family. You go out, outside, look around the property and, and sure enough, chances are 
if you can get close to the neighbors, they'll be having things happening as well. So this is how this idea of flap areas developed with us, uh, seemingly unrelated, uh, paranormal phenomena of, of all kinds, seemingly unrelated, uh, occurring in the same area, such as the Mothman situation in the Ohio Valley of the U.S. in the 1960s, Rendlesham Forest. And we've been there, and we've done what most researchers have not done, talked with local witnesses, and we found a bunch of things that happened not only in December of 1980, but that are happening now. Um, ben had such a weird experience, he wouldn't go back the next day. Nope. And uh, the, um, so uh, Litchfield, uh, Connecticut Triangle, which is, um, has a core of about five square miles, but is actually extending uh, square miles around that area, touching the Hudson River Valley in New York. And then we've got Bigfoot, all kinds of UFO activity poltergeist activity, shadow people, things that don't have names yet. Uh, there is a photograph of this huge thing standing at someone's, in someone's kitchen when they weren't home because there had been break-ins in the area uh, and uh, they, they, nothing had been stolen. Uh, they put up security cameras and, and they got this thing in their kitchen. So things like this uh, are, are occurring uh, routinely in this area. Um, also, and this is quite... Uh, I think uh, significant. Uh, the military started showing up in '09. What we think is the military. Well, what, what could be the military? We're not sure whether this is governments or not. Right. And uh, people would would uh, begin to uh, would they be walking their dogs and, and uh, armed people in camo or black would tell them they can't come this way you know, very courteously and then turn them around and have to go. Uh, Mark D'Antonio, a very dear friend of ours, who's working on this case with us is a, a bona fide astronomer, and he's also um, the uh, Mutual UFO Network's uh, national analyst of photo and video evidence in this country. So uh, he uh, himself has had experiences there, so has his family. Uh, there is a farm uh, where there is no farming going on. All sorts of sophisticated the military equipment were coming and going. Uh, we are in contact with a, um, a civilian who, sta- who installed all sorts of strange radio equipment there. Uh, there was strange air traffic. Uh, and, and the farm is, again, no farming. Uh, we believe that the military might be uh, interested in this because, boy, wouldn't we love to weaponize the paranormal, particularly learn how to manipulate space and time or appear to. Well, apparently it's owned by a company that does aerospace contracts for the U.S. military. Right. We, after going through many channels and following many paper trails, which were very badly covered up, <laughs> yeah. like not even attempting to cover it up at all, I guess they sort of assumed no one would attempt to look at it. Or maybe it's a ploy. Who knows? But it's very strange because it, it looks like a huge dairy barn. And there's no sign of anybody there ever. I think the most that we've seen any was a dog. And not a running. single cow. Yeah. Well, we, we have spies, you know, spies, if, for lack of a better term. Now, how do you cover a case of this scope? Uh, well, our show has um, uh, reporters uh, who um, w- you know, w- will recruit people for us to take, kind of keep an eye on things. And we make it a point for them not to know each other so that there's no suggestibility in this sort of thing. And they're, they're not particularly trained observers, but any information is, uh, can be useful and can be uh, followed up. So, uh, that, but that's only one case of that kind we're working on now. Uh, we're, we're, we have just started one uh, last year in western Pennsylvania where similar things are going on. Uh, I myself, uh, we, we were there, um, and Ben hasn't been there yet, but he's going to be because he needs to do his thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Shane Searway, someone else you should have on your show, if I may suggest, uh, who is a very, very good combination of a Blackfoot shaman and a feet-on-the-ground investigator. He's from New Hampshire. What was his name he's again? Out there. Uh, Shane Searway, trueghost.com. Okay. And he and I have been out there uh, twice uh, Ran told him about five days. Um, he and I have both had Bigfoot sightings. I had never in my life expected. And uh, now when people come to me, I won't take them with a pillar of salt anymore. I guess it's happened to me. At least I you think it did. And uh, th- this, uh, all sorts of lights in the sky. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting. Of 20 people showed up and told us they were experiencing. The next step, there is a location similar. Maybe I shouldn't say this on the air, but... Uh, a location similar to the farm in Connecticut where a similar activity has been uh, occurring, though, on a smaller scale. So, again, we're just beginning that. Um, we're just at the embryonic stage of a case in Texas that centers around an airport. Lots of UFO activity, strange things, again, uh, a la flap areas. So uh, we're pretty busy lately, and I'm happy to keep you posted and uh, keep you in the loop, Anthony. 
I think this is the thing that interests me, and it's, I think, profoundly important. It's, it's people like John Keel and people like Jacques Fali, the people who are actually bringing together the UFO phenomenon, the abduction phenomenon, Bigfoot, and, and other anomalies together to say that this seems to be some kind of universal phenomenon that's related in some way, that there is a relationship. So, for instance, to turn around and say, you know, that UFOs are just kind of solid machines that come from Alpha Centauri or wherever, or Zeta Reticula or whatever, it's, there's more to this than that. You know, that, that there's something very, very curious going on. And I, I'm pretty damn sure that nobody really knows what is happening here. But clearly something is. And it, it's, it is a profound importance that there's guys like you out there really digging over the land and actually saying, look, we've got an open mind on this. Because what I was really impressed was, you know, Ben's knowledge of science, the way he was talking about the acoustics there. You know, you are not sort of naive people running around in haunted houses. You are people that are actually doing the science and trying to understand what is this telling us about the nature of reality, um, which I think is incredible. Now, it, 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 Paul, you mentioned before that was it at Rendlesham that Ben had the experience that worried him, or was it somewhere else? Because I was very intrigued with your links to Rendlesham here. Um, because, of course, you know, there's, there's still an awful lot of controversy about Rendlesham Forest and exactly what took place. But if anybody goes to that area of Suffolk, you know, and I said the, the, the green children, um, the, 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 there, is, there is a kind of a really weird feeling about that area. Again, it's as if it's one of these kind of window locations, a flat location, as you call it, that there seems to be that the interfaces are just thinner in some way. So in terms of your own viewpoint, after many, many years and Ben's involvement as well, what, do you, what, what is your overall hypothesis as to what you think is happening here? I know we've touched upon the many worlds interpretation. We've touched upon other issues. But where, where do you think everything is leading you to and what conclusions are you coming to in terms of this? Well, if you look at the holographic theory, um, mm. you, which, which really can be the other side of the coin of the MWI, we talk about the unity with a capital U. And if you if, uh, turning home, God goes in human history, so you know what I'm talking about. I think yeah. that, that it's all not just random and haphazard. I think there was a certain elegance to the interaction of all these worlds, the many versions of ourselves that may be there, but the holographic theory is, is that the, the, the matrix will eventually congeal and collapse into one great unity. That's one way to look at it anyway. And certainly, um, with my, my background in theology has provided, uh, I think, in a way, a way to look at this uh, on a point of view that is not often heard in the paranormal, I don't think. Uh, and that's the, the, uh, the theology of Teilhard de Chardin. It says precisely the same thing, and he was writing about this mm -hmm. in the fifties. The omega points. The omega points. Yeah. You know, yeah, the omega you know, points is. Like yeah, the omega points and the work of John Wheeler. You know, the, these kind of areas are coming together in a wonderful way. Sorry, I was just jumping in there because I was just very interested. In you mentioned Tyler de Chardin, who is a great intellectual hero of mine. That's all. Oh, really? That's mine too. Uh, you know, we're practically twins, Tony. I think. But uh, in, the, in any case, the, uh, this, this unit, I think this is, this is where it's all going. Now, one thing I, we haven't had time to discuss is the parasite factor. You did bring it up. But there is a dark side to all this, not to sound like Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker here. But uh, it's, it's really something that I think needs to be considered because uh, we've, we run into that very frequently, and I certainly ran into it in that Bridgeport Poltergeist case in 1974. And uh, that's the beginning of another discussion. Uh, but I think that despite that, uh, we, are, we are looking at the, the, the coming together of many, many worlds into an elegant uh, unity that is a true unity. Now, people often come after me for not espousing their religious beliefs because of my seminary background. And I was in the seminaries of two different uh, denominations and, and learned the different Eastern and Western points of view and this sort of thing. And I think that um, people will say, okay, well, well, God and creation, what does this mean for God and creation? Well, I think it enhances the, the, the uh, rather crippled human understanding of, of God 
whatever he, she, it, or them may be. And we're looking at a, what did we learn in church school last summer? Whatever. Creation was the, the, the necessary outlet for God, the explosion of divine love. That's what it says. Well, if divine love is infinite, wouldn't the creation be infinite? And how would the creation be infinite? And not just variety. There would be every single possibility, every single probability would be real somewhere or somewhere, forming one great, elegant unity, perhaps a perfect creation. So creation maybe is perfect. Just not our definition of it. Yeah, just, just not, a, not on our terms. You know? But were, were we to come together with, with our total multiverse awareness, our other selves, which are, it's all one big us out there, uh, then it would be perhaps a perfect tree. Now, I'm getting goofy here. But this gets off into stuff Teatro de Chardin would, wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. But uh, these are all possibilities. Maybe this is where it is tending. And well, but it's the argument, isn't it? It's all of it. Well, it's the argument, isn't it? You know, you look, you look at um, uh, the the idea of Aldous Huxley and the perennial for uh, the per- perennial for all philosophy, the idea that all within all religious belief systems and within all esoteric belief systems, there is there is a central central consistency, and it, it's finding the God within. It's looking within yourself to find the greater something. Now, I've recently contributed a chapter to a book on pandeism which came out in January this year, in fact, came out a few weeks ago. And again, you know, this is the central theme, the idea that we are emanations of greater something. You go into the Kabbalah, you have the concept of the Orain Sof, you have various ways, the concept of Brahman, the concept of, of Maya within Hinduism, that this is some kind of illusion. And what is happening now is that science... We are starting to understand the holographic nature of reality. We, we, we have more and more information now in terms of, of how information, three-dimensional information, seems to be created in a two-dimensional way on the edges of black holes. So suddenly we're actually finding now that the interface between my consciousness and external reality is far more complex than, than most people ever believe. As you know, there is this general term called naive realism, And there are people that believe there's a one-to-one relationship between what I perceive in my visual world and and all my world through all my senses is a one-to-one relationship with what is out there externally. But, of course, that is naive realism. There is a far more complex interface here. And I think holograms, as we discover more of holograms and as we discover more about virtual reality, You know, when people are now interested in the whole idea of three-dimensional virtual reality using things like an Oculus Rift and everything else, suddenly our understanding is changing. And it's as if our generation is, 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 is at this big point where we can conceptualize of the mysteries that you experience all through and you both experience in a very, very direct way. And I always argue that you know that those experiences took place. Whatever a skeptic may say and whatever somebody may dismiss and say it was an hallucination, well, it's an hallucination. But then again, this reality is an hallucination by exactly the same definition. So we're getting into something very, very interesting and very, very powerful. And that's why I think your work is so, so important. You are at the front line. You're the guys that are really going out there. And when you interviewed me for my show, I was so keen to get you on here because there was a, there was a resonation between what I'm trying to do from the theoretical viewpoint to what you're trying to do out there making it happen. And all I can say is massive congratulations to what you're doing because your work is so, so important. Now, in terms of this, we're now coming towards the end of our time, and we will get you back on again because I think we've just scratched the surface here. Can you let my my listeners and my readers know how they can contact you, tell them about the book, your website, your podcast, and everything else? Because I'm sure there's going to be an awful lot of people out there jumping up and down with excitement and saying, gosh, we've really got to know what these guys are doing. So please give them the opportunity to know how they can contact you and your, your, your website and everything else. Well, thank you, Anthony. People can begin at BehindTheParanormal.com. Uh, that's our radio show website. Uh, we broadcast on uh, Sundays live, 12 uh, Eastern Time to noon. I should say noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time on WOON 1240 AM station in the Boston Providence area. Uh, however, there are um, free, uh, almost 700 hours, over 700 hours of free shows uh, on the Behind the Paranormal, BehindTheParanormal.com site. Uh, show number 668 
from 2016 is our show with Anthony. Terrific show. That's how we got to know each other. And uh, God help the world now. Uh, so, um, uh, and everything, there are all kinds of links from there, emails. You can contact us, uh, the books you can get there and all those sorts of things. The, the books are all available on Amazon and all the usual suspects. And uh, I think the, what we can say is uh, from the Schrodinger point of view, may we all find our inner cat. Yes. I like that. Yes, we all have our inner cast. Meow. That's wonderful. Okay, thank you very much for your time. And I know that you are incredibly busy, guys, because I, I look at your details and you're being interviewed coast to coast. You're, you're on everything at the moment, plus doing your own show. So you're rushing around like scalded cats at the moment. See cat analogy again. Um, so all the best. Thank you very much for, for joining us. We will have you on the show again um, soon because I think it's important that we have to scratch the surface. And one of the things that Deer and myself have discussed is that at some stage we need to get some kind of really big conference going where we have some of the really major thinkers like yourselves together. Because it's like a Venn diagram, isn't it? We're all beavering away in our own areas. But in the middle is this massive overlap. And in that middle is the truth. And I think we're getting closer and closer to that. Of course, the implications are there. When we discover the truth, what happens to the matrix? Okay. Okay, thanks very much, guys. And again, as always, thanks to Dia Nunes in the background over there in Denver, Colorado, for her help, because without her, this show wouldn't ever get online. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anthony.